We're all set. Great. Good afternoon. Happy February to everyone. We've gotten a couple of really nice days with some actual sunshine, um, which I so appreciate. Just letting folks uh, trickle in through the uh, the narrow tubes of the internet, because that's how I think it works. Um, and I'm so happy today to welcome you here to talk about um, uh, continue our conversation about paths to wellness. And today we have an amazing speaker who's a former UVM trainee, um, Christy Foreman, who I was able to have breakfast with and spend the weekend with at a conference uh, back last fall. And that conversation evolved into this um, invitation to speak. So I'm really excited to have her here today. Um, I want to take a moment to um, invite Dean Page into this space um, and just say, you know, I'm reflecting on the um, art of observation uh, conversation that we had last night. Local artist Mary Lacey was able to come and, and hang an art installation and faculty, staff and students gathered to talk about the overlap between art and medicine. And I really wanted to extend a thank you to Dean Page for prioritizing these kind of community conversations. And this is another community conversation that's just so important. It's the it's the glue for all of us, and it's how we keep a, a productive and a and a wellness focused workplace. So, Dean Page, thank you so much for the work you do in this space. Thank you very much, Dr. Doherty. Hello, everyone, and 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 welcome. Uh, on, on at least my behalf to another one of these, just out, the outstanding series we have in terms of the gender equity education series. And I, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Doherty and her role as director for gender equity and the entire steering committee who uh, tirelessly put together these awesome sessions where I, I learned so much and I, I, I know we all are, are really grateful for. Um, I'm gonna be quiet other than just saying, I'm glad to be here and thanks for everybody joining us and thanks for the group. Uh, I'm gonna kick things over to Dr. Doherty and then our own Dr. Jennifer Hall is gonna introduce uh, Dr. Foreman. I love the title, Prescribing Joy. Having been in clinic yesterday, I, I need to add that to, uh, to the prescriptions I provide. Um, we all need, more joy in our lives and 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 frankly this series and interacting with all of you brings me joy so i could go on forever about that but i'll shut up right here and and uh and be quiet and listen and learn thank you thanks so much dean page um i love that we can all come together and and learn together um, so I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Jennifer Hall, um, a friend and a colleague um, who is a member of the Gender Equity um, Education and Professional Development Working Group, which is part of the group that puts on this series. Um, Dr. Hall is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, she is a geriatric psychiatri psychiatrist by trade. Um, and uh, also uh, has uh, an interim position as a vice chair in psychiatry. Um, so happy to have her as part of our community doing important work with our aging population. And so I'm going to turn her over to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Hall. Hello and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to introduce our incredible speaker today, who I'm also privilege to call friend, Dr. Christina Foreman. Dr. Foreman is a graduate of the Psychiatry Residency Program and the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship here at UVM. She is currently based in Denver, Colorado, where she works on a child and adolescent psychiatry inpatient unit. Throughout her career, Dr. Foreman has been a proponent of positive psychiatry and lifestyle-focused approaches to mental health. Her dedication extends to her keen interest in workplace well-being, where she actively applies principles from positive psych psychology and lifestyle medicine to enhance employee satisfaction and resilience. 
Dr. Foreman co-founded the Wellbeing Collaborative within the UVM Psychiatry Department, emphasizing the importance of fostering a healthy work environment. Additionally, she has conducted appreciative inquiries in Vermont and Colorado, furthering her commitment to understanding and promoting well-being within psychiatry settings. Dr. Foreman's influence extends beyond her immediate workplace as she co-founded the Vermont Women in Psychiatry Group and the Colorado Women in Psychiatry Group, both initiatives aimed at creating supportive communities that champion and amplify women's voices in the field. These groups serve as dynamic platforms for collaboration, mentorship, and the exchange of innovative ideas. Welcome, Dr. Foreman. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. Um, and I um, really, really miss Vermont. I trained in Vermont, moved to Denver about two and a half years ago. But man, um, do I miss the easy driving. Colorado traffic is no joke. Um, and a couple of restaurants as well. And so I'm um, really excited to be invited here. Um, I got to meet Anne at a conference in the fall. Um, and it's just so full circle and exciting to be back in Vermont giving this presentation. So I will share my screen. All right. Is everybody able to see it all right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and so I don't have any disclosures, really only a passion for this topic. And I am here today to talk about my own pathway to wellness, but I love that this is a series that you all are embarking on together. I just picture this kind of meandering pathway. And I do want to acknowledge, though, that there are many different pathways. And so, um, I hope you can take something from mine, but we're all walking different pathways uh, alone at the end of the day. So my pathway really begins and ends with these concepts of positive psychology and lifestyle medicine. And as you can see above, it's really, really winding. And I'm excited to share with you some of the pieces of that pathway and how I've got to where I am today. And it's something I feel really passionate about. So we're gonna start with an icebreaker. And before you're groaning internally, no, I'm not gonna have you do an icebreaker. I'm gonna share a little bit about one that was posed to me. I know that your um, lunch hour is very precious. And so please do what you need to in the next hour uh, to take care of yourself. And hopefully along the way, um, there'll be something that you're able to take away from this. But this was a question that was posed to me at an event for women to help us develop leadership skills as early career providers at my hospital. And the question was, what is the best and worst advice you have received? Now, I did groan a little bit internally when I heard this. Uh, I was going second, so I knew that I had to come up with something pretty quickly. But luckily, I had something in mind to answer. And that was the worst advice I had ever been given was to not speak up about medical student mistreatment. And I did speak up when I was a medical student about mistreatment. And what that led to was this passion for trainee and provider well-being that has really come through my career thus far. And so, in a way, this advice might also have been the best advice I've received, received and that it really spurred my passions. As Dr. Hall alluded to at my time at UVM, because of this passion, I was able to help co-create the UVM Psychiatry Department Wellbeing Collaborative with Dr. Rosenfeld. With Dr. Hall, we co-created a Vermont Women in Psychiatry group. And then a real lovely full circle moment was that myself as an attending was able to help a resident just like Dr. Hall had helped me to develop the Colorado Women in Psychiatry group here. But back to that question, what is the best and worst advice you have received? And this was a question that was um, posed to the senior leadership at my hospital during the seminar. And some of the advice I thought was really helpful and worth sharing today. And some of it fell into my own personal worst advice category. Also, I think it's um, beneficial to share um, because we can learn from it. 
But the advice that I really liked was that these leaders shared that we should be showing appreciation often. This is something that I um, am a strong believer in. And a recent Gallup and Work Human poll found that only 18% of healthcare workers are saying that their teams and groups of people are feeling recognized at their organization. So I think there is a lot of room for improvement. And these women also recommended we should be taking a lot of time to listen to our colleagues to connect with them, which leads to that last point that social connection is important. I know personally, this is a really big buffer to burnout for myself. However, when they were asked how they got to where they were in leadership as women, they said, we got divorced, we don't sleep, and don't say no. And I would really like to think that something has changed in 2024. You know, the ACGME has really noted uh, that physician well being is a priority. However, I still think too often we are asked to sacrifice our relationships, our health, our sleep. And we're told, especially early in our career, that we should not say no to any opportunities. I know I've had that advice before, and it has definitely made me really nervous. Um, but being able to help to define our boundaries and when it's okay to say no is really an important skill to learn. And so, unfortunately, this advice did fall into my worst advice category, and I think is a recipe to burnout. And while today's conversation is really not going to be focused solely on burnout, I'm sure you've had many talks thus far. I agree that there does need to be the systemic approach overall that is taken, but this is going to be more targeted to things that we are able to do personally to help burnout, but also enhance well-being and life satisfaction along the way. What I think is so beautiful about this approach that I've been privy to practicing is not only does it enhance our own well-being, but it's also an opportunity to enhance patient care, and we can do the two simultaneously because I know we're busy. And so with that, back to this idea of a pathway to wellness. And before we jump in, I would really like to offer some advice that I found really helpful. So at that event that I was with um, Dr. Hall and Dr. Um, Dougherty this fall, one of the speakers, her name was Sai Wakeman, and she was a drama researcher. And she offered a suggestion to the audience that I found really helpful and I'd like to share with you. What she suggested was that instead of having goals, we should have directions. And when I heard this, it felt like this weight had just been lifted off of my shoulders. To be honest, I am not very good at setting SMART goals, nor can I stick to them. And then I just beat myself up if I, in the week I didn't you know, do my three yoga classes and my meditation in the evening and have you know, my plant-based meals. But what I am good at is, and pretty set on, is the direction that I would like to take my life and my career. So by reframing having a direction instead of having goals, it really allowed me to feel okay with those bends and those curves in knowing that a lot of what I'm doing does move me in the right direction without having to hit those certain goals and timelines. And so if that feels helpful for you, I invite you to keep that in mind as you're listening. When I was thinking about when our pathways to wellness really start, I think for many, it might officially start when we don our white coat at the white coat ceremony. Here's me in Newcastle in the UK, where I did my first year of medical school in my white coat at my white coat ceremony. And I think that as many of us are entering medical school, we have this idea that we're gonna be helping with the health and wellness of our patients and really be able to make a big difference. I know I sure was. And so following the white coat ceremony, there's often an oath swearing. This here is the Learner College Medicine of Medicine oath. And I would like to highlight a couple pieces of it. First, it highlights the idea that we should strive to prevent disease. 
I think a lot of us are entering medical school with that hope in mind. However, with the current systems of care that we have in place, often the focus isn't on preventing disease and we're kind of stuck chasing symptoms. I know for me, a lot of the time I have this feeling of what am I even doing to help my patients? And at the bottom, it describes this idea of the joy of healing. And I also think that some of that might have been lost in medicine. However, these two ideas are really important. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have an updated idea of how we can live up to the oath of preventing disease and experiencing the joy of healing. What I think this oath is missing, however, is this idea that we need to attend to our own health and well-being and abilities in order to provide the highest standard of care. This is the World Medical Association's Declaration of Geneva, the updated um, Hippocratic Oath, if you will. And they added this uh, to the oath in 2017, and it is being adopted by a lot of medical schools. I think this concept is so important. If you think about it, we are patients ourselves first and foremost, and really need to think about how we are addressing our own health and well-being. And there are two terms here that I think are really important to define, health and well-being. In my own pathway to wellness, it definitely helped when I started to get a new definition of these concepts. The first is health. And this is the World Health Organization's definition. And it is not as an absence of disease or infirmity, but as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And when I learned this back in residency, it really expanded my idea of what I was able to offer to my patients for treatment, but what I should also be seeking out for myself in terms of idea health. I love that there is a highlight not only on physical and mental well-being, but also social well-being. And the other component of this definition is this idea of well-being and that our jobs as doctors might not stop once disease or mental illness has gotten better. What if we could serve as a source of information for our patients about how they can improve their own well-being and life satisfaction? And if we're continuously doing so, the information is also constantly presented to us and then easier to practice ourselves. And so what is well-being? Back when I started my wellness journey at the start of medical school, my definition might have really started and ended here after a quick Google search as well-being being the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. We know that well-being as a word has become kind of trendy over time. We can see that increase of searches in use um, kind of peaking in the, you know, the mid-2000s. And in the upcoming slides, I'd like for you to get this expanded definition of what well-being might mean for you, but also what you can offer your patients. And so health and well-being, in my view, can be pursued through positive psychology, some of that joy that the oath alludes to, and lifestyle medicine, some of that prevention piece, and we'll move into these promptly. And so positive psychology really isn't just for psychiatrists and psychologists. In fact, I think it's important for every field of medicine, for patient care, for colleague relations, for burnout prevention, as well as hospital leadership. It is the study of factors that allow individuals and communities to flourish and have enhanced well-being. Martin Seligman was the original creator of these ideas in the late 1990s. And what he found was that psychologists had been so focused on distress that their mission to promote strengths and excellence and flourishing had all but fallen away. 
And he has since helped to create a field of study that really aligns perfectly with this World Health Organization definition of health which really aids to expand the role of healthcare providers to not just end with disease, but move into the well-being sphere. What are some of the benefits of well-being? Why should we focus on it as healthcare providers for our patients, but also ourselves? There are many benefits. Uh, we might perform better at work, have more satisfying relationships, might be more cooperative, even lower levels of burnout if we're unable to enhance this. But what I find is really interesting is that if we're able to enhance well being, we're also seeing a host of physical benefits, including a stronger immune system, better overall physical health, longevity having reduced cardiovascular mortality, and having fewer sleep problems. And so uh, this is um, an acronym PERMA, and it was created by Martin Seligman to hit on five factors that develop well-being and is the updated definition of well-being that I would like for you to take away today. I like grounding myself in this acronym, but also using it in patient care conversations when thinking through what else am I able to offer them. And as we go through the acronym, I encourage you to post something in the chat for each of the letters and um, a plot overview before we jump into each individually is that in order to have enhanced well-being, we're gonna need P for positive emotion, E for engagement, R for positive relationships, M for meaning, and A for accomplishment. So again, in the chat, as I invite you to, please write out what each letter means for you as we go through them now. And so P is for positive emotion. And for many, this might be where your definition of well-being ends. Things that bring you joy or happiness, awe, contentment, gratitude, optimism. And we know that for positive emotions, it's really important that we have a ratio of about three to one positive to negative emotions. And luckily, well-being is much more than that. We have four other letters that can help to enhance well-being because positive emotions can be pretty nuanced. They can also be impacted by genetics. And there's this concept of the hedonic treadmill that there's only so much happiness we might be able to feel before we kind of go back to our genetic set point. But for most people, this is something that can be enhanced. And for me, um, something that brings me a lot of positive emotion at work is my own daily ritual of using um, a moment in the morning when I'm filling up my water bottle to look out over the front range mountains that we have a view of here and just uh, take in what they look like and have this moment of awe and contentment. And so I'll invite you into the chat to um, take a couple of minutes or maybe about a minute to, to brainstorm what brings you positive emotions and I'll read out a couple of the answers. Satisfaction. Yeah, that might move also into the accomplishment sphere. Anybody else wanting to put anything in the chat? Relating to animals. Gardening. Yeah, I share that one with you, Dr. Hall. Seeing the sun. I heard that January was maybe your gloomiest month since the 1950s in Vermont. Music. Love. Yeah, all really good things for sure. All right, let's move on to the next one. Oh, I like that last one, kids. As a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I'm a little bit <laughs> biased. Uh, we have Drew saying skiing, small wonders every day, really neat to appreciate that. Your cat's toe beans, beautiful. I love it. All right, let's move on to the next part of PERMA. And that is E for engagement. 
This is Chick sent me high's work on the flow state. And so these are states we get into when time seems to slow down. We're so engaged in that activity. And as humans, we uh, choose to um, engage in these activities because it feels so good to be in that state. And this can come from work. I know if I'm having a good patient interview or really excited to talk about a topic like today, time is flying by. But other people can get this through sports, through family activities, through music, through creative pursuits. And there are a lot of ways to enter into that flow state where time just seems to not be something we're thinking about. So again, in the chat, I invite you to think through, are there any activities that bring you a sense of engagement or flow? Mm -hmm. We have mentoring colleagues and teaching. Yeah, I love that this is something we're able to enter into during our workday, writing, lake dipping, got a fellow fan of reading, practicing the ukulele, got learning new things, dancing. I was doing a little bit of that before this meeting and actually locked myself out of the office. Um, yeah, all great things that can bring us into that flow state for sure. And I love seeing you all engaging like this. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. And that is positive relationships. And I think that this is such an important concept to think about, especially in the midst of a loneliness epidemic. More and more in the work that I'm doing as a psychiatrist, I think that connection and positive relationship is really at its core. Uh, and I know for myself that I've identified connecting and gathering others is one of my core values. So in the chat, I'll have you note what is one relationship at work this time that you're grateful for? For me, I'm really grateful for the support of my colleagues um, who let me take time and are covering for me today to give this talk. And then also my colleagues in Vermont for inviting me here. So again, in the chat, what is one relationship at work you're grateful for? Leadership team members, yeah, so important to have that strong leadership setting the tone right from the top. Any other shout outs? Support staff, yes, definitely. Interim chair, yeah, got one for Emily. Having a supportive chair, definitely. I'm seeing this theme of leadership and really having strong leaders setting the tone for an organization can be so helpful. Awesome. All right. The next one is meaning or purpose. And this is what is it that we belong to or serve that is bigger than ourselves. I also really like to think of this as values and what is it that is aligning with our values. A great way to help decrease burnout is really to be working in a job that aligns with our values and value systems. And so I invite you to think through that a little bit yourself. What is it that is important to you and what do you value? For me, I get a lot of meaning and purpose in teaching these ideas. So even if my day-to-day -day job isn't necessarily always bringing that same feeling, I can really ground myself and return back to some of these concepts that do ground me in purpose and meaning. And so I'll pose that to the group. Is there anything that brings you a sense of purpose or meaning or something that you highly value? Decreasing maternal mortality, I love that. Dr. Hall said community. Yeah, a lot for building community. I love that. Anybody else before we move on to accomplishments? Ooh, helping medical students flourish. I share that one as well. It's so gratifying to see students or even residents and fellows learning um, and having their own kind of sense of purpose and meaning through this journey. All right, 
We'll end then with A for accomplishment. I also like to think of this one as what is it that you're proud of? And I know earlier I did give that suggestion of having a direction instead of set goals that we're accomplishing, but it is known that in order to enhance well-being, we do need to be working towards things and accomplishing them. So I'll post this to the group. Is there anything that you're proud of recently that you would like to highlight or note? This one takes a little bit more brain power. It's hard to focus on what we're doing well. I sure know that. Yeah, somebody said also hard for women to brag about themselves, for sure. Yeah, um, somebody said focusing on health by increasing water intake. See me doing that um, in gym time. I love that. Really good. Bringing your New Year's resolution into February. Ooh, seeing mentees succeed. Yeah, another successful promotion season within our faculty. Ooh, trying out new leadership opportunities. Yeah. That is a big thing to be proud of for sure. Awesome. Oop, doing my first manuscript peer review. Kudos to you. Um, that is something that um, is so neat. And I just want you all to do this brief internal check-in on how it felt to be thinking about these components for yourself and hearing what your colleagues were listening. I know that personally, this exercise always brings me really a sense of joy and hopefulness. I know I feel more grounded after reading this. It's hard not to when really celebrating success and thinking about these concepts of well-being. So thank you uh, for participating in the chat. And digging into this concept a little bit further is um, this idea of the broaden and build theory. And this is a theory that I use at work every day, not only in the work that I do with my patients, but how I try to interact with colleagues and trainees. And I'm really, really excited to share it with you. It was created by Barbara Fredrickson, who is a researcher on positive emotion, and she sought to find out what was the role of positive emotions and how did they help women or humans, women too, um, from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, up to this point, negative emotions had been pretty heavily researched, and they had been found to have what are called really narrow action tendencies and responses. And so think about that fight, flight, or freeze response that can occur um, with negative emotions. Our brain has like a set pattern that it's going to fire in, often uh, in service of survival. But Positive emotions were and are were a little bit more nebulous until Barbara Fredrickson's work. And what she found was that if we're able to evoke positive emotions in that three to one ratio, in this case, this research was doing it using a loving kindness meditation that helped to elicit love or joy, gratitude, uh, contentment, hope, a whole host of different positive emotions. She saw that by evoking positive emotions, what it does is it actually broadens people's attention and thinking. And so in this case, by doing a loving kindness medica meditation, people were feeling warmth and caring towards themselves and others. But what is so cool about this is that by evoking positive emotion, it actually has been found to build resources in the cognitive, psychological, social, and physical domain. And so by simply increasing positive emotions, we can lead to enhanced life satisfaction and decreased depression and another um, host of benefits seen here. Fredrickson and colleagues have shown over time that building on positive emotions can enhance cognitive um, capabilities such as mindfulness, having more agency, being better at savoring those events, um, being quicker at learning and having an improved IQ. They've also shown a host of puzzle psychological benefits, including optimism and resi resilience, which I think is really important for our work, but also for our patient care. 
a whole host of social benefits, and then also a bunch of physical benefits that are reminiscent of what enhancing well-being in general can do, including uh, a better immune system, less pain, faster recovery from illness, and even uh, improved vagal tone. So in my mind, when thinking about this, if we're able to use positive emotions strategically, when we think about our patient encounters or encounters with colleagues or in the community, it seems like something that's a pretty small tweak that could have a whole host of benefits. From a clinical perspective, in one study that evoked positive emotions by giving candy to the providers, here I chose some nostalgic Easter candy, what they found was a statistically significant effect in how quickly a hypothesis about the right diagnosis was made in reading through a case protocol compared to providers who didn't have positive emotions evoked within them first. They also found that those who were primed with positive emotions had less anchoring, meaning they weren't stuck on certain points in the case protocol and they were more flexible in their thinking. There was, however, in that middle, no difference in how far into the protocol the physicians established the right diagnosis. This is a powerful example of how this could be used clinically to think more flexibly about our patients and also a really good reminder to think about how and why we should use these principles when we're thinking through cases ourselves or talking to trainees. And so perhaps taking the time to evoke within yourself, your colleagues or trainees, a positive emotion could lead to a different or better conversation and outcome. This is also very helpful to think about when talking to our patients, which leads me to the idea of the positive assessment. And this was something that was really foundational in my wellness journey. And I learned about it actually at a grand rounds in the Davis Auditorium during my own residency training um, many years back now. And this is Alan Schlechter's work out of NYU, and he came up with this idea of the positive assessment that really beautifully summarizes the broaden and build theory in PERMA that we've just reviewed and applies it to the clinical interview. And what he um, and co his colleagues have found and argue is that this typical interview format is outdated and old, created by a bunch of white men back in like what the 1800s. So they were sitting there around a table thinking about how we should talk to patients. And um, you know what we always have been taught is to start with the chief complaint. That is how we ask, talk to our patients. That's how we write our notes. But what that's doing is evoking negative emotions first. Often chief complaints can be wrought with embarrassment or fear or shame or vulnerability. And you can do this internal check-in yourself to, to see, have you ever had a patient who's been confused or disengaged, withdrawn, vulnerable, distressed, or depressed when you enter and start with, what is your chief complaint? And if a patient is primed and in, in this state, it isn't gonna lead to very productive treatment planning or outcomes. I know I have had this happen many times before I started to keep these principles in mind and even sometimes when I'm using them. But what Dr. Schlechter has found is that if we start by evoking positive emotions first, this can lead to increased rapport and more collaborative treatment planning. And while this might feel difficult at first, I know when I am introducing this concept to medical students and trainees, they just wanna rush through it really quickly and get right back to the chief complaint. If we're able to slow down and try this approach first, it can actually lead to faster gains when we do talk about the challenges and a more robust and satisfying treatment planning process. So time up front really can lead to save time later on and even better outcomes. 
Dr. Schlechter has really built on this idea that if we evoke positive emotions first, we can lead to enhanced openness and flexibility in creative thinking and behavior, which is exactly how we want to have interactions with our patients. And over time, um, if we're able to do this with our patients, it can lead to these upward spirals. And what I think is so brilliant about this approach is that in doing this with our patients, I also have a chance throughout my day to feel positive emotion because I'm evoking it in my patients or when I'm having a conversation with a trainee or a colleague. And I love sharing in other people's joy. And so I also am getting my own upward spirals throughout the day, instead of just being burnt out on asking over and over and over again, what is that chief complaint, which I do get to just in a different way. And so I think this can pay off for the patient, but also the provider. And it really doesn't take too long in trying this approach to be won over. I always like to offer some ideas of some language to use or a script you can use um, to get going with, with trying this out. So you might say in a patient encounter, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to get to know you as a whole person and learn about your well-being. And this will help with my treatment planning and recommendations. We'll reassure them that we'll get to what brought you in momentarily, but first you will, I would like to know. And then what Dr. Schlechter recommends is maybe using that PERMA model of well-being to think through some questions you could ask, which is really a great framework for evoking positive emotion, but also allowing for us to get the sense of where our patients are at in their own well-being and where we might want to make some recommendations. So using that similar model, if we were to think about some things we could ask to get at positive emotion, we might want to know, is there anything you're grateful for today? This is a really great grounding exercise for patients, but also something we could do ourselves or reflect on, um, you know, when we're starting our day or before a clinic. You could ask, what's gone well since I last saw you? I think it's so great for us to acknowledge with our patients that there are things that maybe are going well. Our brains are so used to having this negativity bias that we really need to train it to see the positive. And again, that's a really powerful personal exercise. Uh, you could ask about their strengths. What is it? What character strengths are they bringing into their care or treatment? This is a whole other talk. I'm really passionate about character strengths, um, but getting to know our own character strengths, um, our patient strengths, but then also bringing this into our work with our colleagues and our trainees is a really worthwhile endeavor. And then if you want to get a lot of brownie points and you're talking to a caregiver, always asking, what do you love about so-and-so is a great way to start uh, uh, interview. For engagement, we might want to ask about involved activities where time flies by. And then in relationships, I always like to know who supports a patient. For meaning, um, you might get at it by asking what is important to you in your life and what are some of your values. And then lastly, for accomplishment, a question I often start my interviews with, is there anything small or big that you're proud of that you've been a part of or done? And I love hearing what my kids tell me. And so by leading with a couple of questions at the start of the interview, both you and the patient will be primed with positive effect and this lovely parallel process of broadening and building can occur. If we think back to the research with the candy, there are also benefits for our own clinical acumen. And to take it one step further, I often will introduce and write out this concept of PERMA and share with my patients what enhanced well-being could look like. And then I have them brainstorm under each of the different letters what is going on for them. And I think that this is just such a lovely thing we can offer our patients as often they've never seen all of the things that they're doing that contributes to their well-being in one place. And it can be a really powerful um, experience. And so I I think that these are some great first steps you could take to incorporate this updated definition of health and well-being into your work. All right, and so hopefully by now we've touched on joy and positive emotion and how we can bring that back into healing, but what about prevention? 
And that is where I think lifestyle medicine comes in. So this is a newer field of medicine that really looks to address the root cause of chronic disease and lifestyle disease through six researched back modifiable risk factors. And so they focus on social connection, stress management, decreasing or no substance use, sleep, uh, exercise and nutrition, whole food plant-based, and what I really love about this is that there's so much overlap with positive psychology and that these ideas can be used in concert. A whole talk could and should be given on lifestyle medicine and the science behind it and why we should be implementing this with our patients. But what I would like to highlight is why we should be thinking about this for ourselves as providers and then taking the spin on it as lifestyle medicine as a way to prevent burnout all the way from primordial prevention, which would be decreasing the risk factors before burnout onset to tertiary prevention. And this was one paper um, that was published recently that showed that um, people who are practitioners of lifestyle medicine and able to implement a greater um, proportion of lifestyle medicine concepts with their patients experience less burnout. I know personally, I've seen that burnout for me often comes um, when I'm feeling the strong sense of a lack of personal accomplishment. Um, I feel as if traditional approaches are often lacking. And what I thought of what I was going to do when I did put on that white coat was that I'd be helping to prevent disease. But in today's model, this is often further from the truth. And I think that this can contribute in the systems we're in right now to that hopelessness and that lack of personal accomplishment. I can tell you how many, I can't tell you how many times I've said to my colleagues, like, what are we even offering um, before I had some of these concepts incorporated into my work? And so with lifestyle medicine, I just feel like I have this expanded toolkit of what I'm offering my patients. And so I do think that lifestyle medicine can play a role in burnout from allowing us to have more tools we can reach to when helping our patients. But I also love that it focuses on the idea of patients having more agency in their care and really working on their health outside of the doctor's office. Currently, patients are pretty passive recipients of their care, and I think it can be really draining for providers when we're shouldering and doing a lot of that work. This paper is brilliant, and it really goes on to highlight how providers have felt that this style of practice can align more with their values, actually allows for providers to see patients getting better, allows patients to have more agency in their care, and then also allows providers to have enhanced satisfaction and meaning in work, because I think a lot of these concepts really align with that picture of care we all hope to provide when we did don our white coats. Practitioners also noted that lifestyle medicine helped them to personally have improved quality of life and less stress when they followed the same principles, which leads me to my next point, that we need to go back to that addition to the Declaration of Geneva that really highlights the importance of us attending to our own health and well-being first and foremost. And I think this is a really nice uh, other opening and invitation for lifestyle medicine concepts. We know from the most recent 2023 Medscape survey of providers that 40% of physicians surveyed are always or most of the time looking after their health and wellness, but that leaves 43% at sometimes and 17% at rarely and never. And I think, to be honest, I've been all around that pie chart at various stages of my training. Um, I probably fall into the sometimes or most of the time, depending on what's going on for me. But what I really like about lifestyle medicine is it offers six buckets to focus on, just like positive psychology offers five avenues to well-being through PERMA. And when I'm thinking through directions for my own health and well-being, maybe I'll go and be in the stress management direction for a while, or maybe I'll jump to sleep, or maybe over to exercise, but I like that it offers these ideas in a structured framework for how we can look after our own health and wellness. So I encourage you to start thinking this through this for yourself as well. 
And lastly, another reason to think through this is Erica Frank's body of work on healthy doc is equals healthy patient. She has shown time and time again that if trainees and providers who have healthy habits are um, really live in that for themselves, they're more likely to counsel their patients on those same habits. She's also shown that if physicians have appropriate self-disclosure or demonstration of their own healthy habits, like if they have a bike in their background or their water bottle on their desk, an apple, um, patients see them as more motivating and are more likely to follow through, through with these recommendations. So what is good for you is truly what is good for your patients. And so I would like to end where we began with this oath, but offer, if I may, an updated version that we can all swear if we want to here and now. And so I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. By practicing lifestyle medicine and positive psychology, I will prevent disease and burnout for prevention is preferable to cure. And lastly, I vow always to act to preserve the finest tradition of my calling, although it might need to be updated, and may I long experience joy engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And so this is the updated Otho Lasagna with additions from the World Medical Association Declaration of Geneva and yours truly. And I'll leave you here with a little bit of homework and a book recommendation. This is something you can screenshot, take a picture of your phone. Um, and it's something I encourage you to journal about or talk with your colleagues about. This is PERMA. Um, and then it has some questions for you about um, lifestyle medicine and health promotion to get you thinking. Um, and so I'll pause for a second, take a drink of my water bottle. And if you want to take a capture of it, I invite you to do that now. And I can always send this out later too. And then lastly, I just want to highlight this book. It's a book that I'm recommending to all of my colleagues and trainees. It was written by a really amazing woman physician, uh, Kelly Harding. She's a board certified psychiatrist and internal medicine doctor and also has a master of public health. I read it last year and it was really instrumental in changing about how I'm thinking about how we can offer health care. It expanded my notion of this biopsychosocial model of care and the social determinants of health. And she's just a lovely human. I had the opportunity to meet her last year too. And so with that, thank you so much. This has just been lovely being able to share my joy with you uh, this morning for me, afternoon for you. And I would welcome any questions or even further conversations or collaborations in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Foreman, for sharing that talk with us. Um, there's so much in there and I feel like there, there are multiple places where we could have you back for another hour or two or three or a workshop um, to continue that conversation. Um, feel free to put questions either in the QA or the chat, both are open right now and I'm watching both of them. Um, I do, I'm, I'm thinking about, and we've had this conversation coming Coming out of training where there's, and med school, all of your training, there's so much that you have to learn in the short period of time. And it sort of leads to, at least in, in my experience, this was a little while ago, um, a sort of mentality of put your head down, keep moving, um, and, and sort of endure. There is, mm -hmm. there, it is, it is like a, a, an endurance activity or endurance race. And I wonder then, like, you know, coming out into practice, it's almost like you have to, you have this process of undoing in order to get back to um, that positive place and that joy seeking place. And I wonder what your thoughts are in ways that we can either adapt training mm -hmm. or um or ways to just to just to mitigate or make that bridge into practice yeah. uh, more smooth 
Yeah, I think this is a great question. And this is something I, I really personally feel very passionate about is that this does need to start in medical school education. Um, and I think that um, positive psychology and lifestyle medicine is still pretty siloed, but I would love to see this being applied in every single medical school um, and in residency and training programs right from the beginning, because I think these concepts are so important. Um, and it really does, um, I think, boil down to um, what we are modeling right for our trainees and our medical students and so I love that I get to do a little bit of that and doing but often it's um, I'm having residents or uh, fourth year fellows coming through the door to me and so it does take more time so I agree I, I, I do think that um, there's a big role for reconsidering our medical school um, curricula, how this is integrated. Um, and that's why I was making these suggestions to the oath, right? We need to lead with what we want to see our future leaders doing. And I, I think that there's a lot of room for, for um, that. And in fact, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's next three year kind of plan is how they can um, systematically get this education into more um, training settings. That's great. That's great. Um, Dr. Bonnie um, says those from marginalized and oppressed communities will have a harder time doing this. And do you have any thoughts on, on that topic? There's, there's also so much in there. Yeah, there is so much in there. It's, um, I, I think something that a lot of people are starting to think about, um, there's this concept of community engaged lifestyle medicine that was brought, um, brought about in Texas um, to address it in the, the marginalized border communities there. Um, but I, I think again, it's gonna come to, to needing to bring this back and start in medical school with this undoing and how we're changing what we're offering to patients from the start. And so I think we as healthcare providers have this opportunity to really sit with patients and talk about what they can do to build their health outside the hospital. And it is going to take a systems approach, but also some individuals who are starting to push this forward. And I, I agree. I think there's, it's a long road ahead of us, but I, I do think that if we're able to continue working with the community, um, we maybe in the future um, can have this just be the standard of care because a lot of what um, these recommendations are are things that are accessible to everybody um, regardless of um, their their socioeconomic kind of factors and so I think it's a long road ahead um, but I think it will start with um, the, the tone we set in medical schools. Thank you. And I'm happy to send out some, some um, articles that are really lovely about DEI and how we can incorporate these more if anybody's interested. If you, if you send me things, I will put okay. them out on the gender equity sure. listserv. And so if anyone wants to sign up for the gender equity listserv who hasn't done so already, Emily can put the link in the chat again. Um, and any other folks that have questions are welcome to put them um, in the chat or in the QA. I do, I, one other question I have is about, you know, it's, it's clear that provider wellness impacts patient wellness um, and, and certainly has a positive impact on healthcare outcomes. And I'm wondering what thoughts you have about what health systems can do to support the wellness of their providers or innovative models that, that might be out there. Yeah. Uh, um, that's a great question. There's actually a really lovely um, research study that's ongoing out of the University of Colorado that I'm also happy to share with the listserv. Um, and I, I think that there's a lot of room for, um, for life coaching and for having coaches for our providers. Um, and they've had some really promising results in um, really investing in the well-being of our providers first to then see the, um, the benefits with patient care. And, and so I think it will take, as we talked about, supportive leaders who want to bring this into, into their care approach and to really value it. But I'm happy to send that out because I think life coaching does have a really promising role in the future of supporting providers. And interestingly, last month's um, gender equity education series was on coaching and the role of coaching. Nice. So we, we've at least gotten a primer on that and, and you and I, I know have been part of circles mm -hmm. that really emphasize the value of coaching um, to be able to support direction 
Mm -hmm. right? Your, the direction of your career. Um, and so I, another question I, I have, and this is, you know, I think this is about prioritization, but, you know, we think about, okay, so now we are going to incorporate just one more thing into our really brief interactions mm -hmm. with patients. Like how, how do we, how do we get our head around the incorporating all these concepts from lifestyle medicine and positive psychology? And you gave examples of some yeah. of the questions, but yeah. you know, from a practical standpoint, yeah. like help me, help me get over that, that resistance or that barrier. Yeah. I think that, um, like I said, like, instead of having these goals have directions for yourself. So I think in starting small and even just maybe trying it out for yourself first of like grounding yourself in some positive emotion before an encounter or having that quick kind of dialogue back and forth with a patient, even if you just choose one question to start with of something that maybe could evoke some positive emotion, but it does, it feels really uncomfortable because essentially, you know, I'm, I'm saying like, add all these things in that make things better. But I, I do really believe if we go back to that broaden and build theory, that if we're able to evoke some positive emotion in the encounter with our patient, it is going to lead to time saved down the line. We just need to try it out ourselves first. And so I think that this is where, um, and I know we're abutting against time, but like we're, we're just really for, um, I think short-sighted in how we're providing care to our patients right now. And I, I, I do think that if we're able to um, make a couple of these small tweaks and it will take time and be gentle with ourselves as we're trying out these new things, it will say have better patient outcomes and more time saved down the line too. And so um, I, I, I have a lot of hope and aspirations for the future. Um, I'm also happy to send out um, a lifestyle medicine vital signs of sorts that you could even just have your patients do um, before the encounter, um, just to kind of start you thinking about it. But uh, would love to keep this conversation going with anybody at any time. Um, and these are just some of my brief thoughts on the, the matter. Well, it's just, a, it's just an initial primer. Yeah. We'll definitely have to have you come back and thank you so much for being here. Um, just before we drop off, I want to remind folks that March 7th is our celebration of gender equity in medicine and science. Um, our own um, Deborah Kumin Makaz will be our keynote speaker and she's talking about intersectionality in life sciences and why it matters. It's going to be really exciting. There's also an award ceremony. Um, the um, the awards uh, nomination form is out and that will be open until February 12th. So please consider uh, submitting an award nomination. And then um, Emily did just put in the link to the gender equity celebration. Um, please join us. Um, it's a great time of year. Thank you again, Dr. Foreman, for being yeah. with us. And thank you all for participating today. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye. Thank you.